first kid over the class of wine. Me too. Me Give me a few more, and I'll tell you some discretions of my vice chancellors and royals. <laughs> Nothing like that about what we've actually done in Wales and how we've managed to progress the OER movement in Wales or how we've started to progress it. Uh, it's not a job that's done, it's just the start of the journey. Um, and I'll take you through some of the challenges that we faced as we were going through that, particularly with senior management uh, within the universities. So I'll do that and then I'll invite you to OER 15, which will be in Wales next year. So, a little bit of context first. Um, quite often I have to tell people where exactly Wales is. <laughs> That's not necessarily when I go international. <laughs> so, yes, we are in Europe. Uh, we're over there on the left hand side. And those are the major areas of our wheels. Typically, we would have got a GDP of 50 billion and a population of 3.1 million. So, in global terms, there aren't an awful lot of us about. But, that doesn't mean to say we can't have an impact on what we do. My colleagues, and Wales asked me to specifically show the next slide. <laughs> now, are there any Welsh speakers in the audience? Okay. Would the Welsh speakers like to translate that for me, please? Wales is an awful big one. Yes, that's it. I'm told quite often, I have to say, Wales is not part of England. <laughs> uh, they're very sensitive. We're very sensitive about that. Uh, and you'll see that in the culture as I go along. Um, and what we've done and how we've done it differently. Some of the things I'm going to talk about today, you could not do in England. You're going to do it in Wales and to a degree probably in Scotland as well because of the size uh, of the country and because of the access that we have to government and to the funding council. Um, that's a double-edged sword. It doesn't always work in our favour. It can be quite interfering at times. But at other times, we can influence government policy, and sometimes we can get our own way. Not very often. <laughs> so, what we've got in Wales is we've got a devolved administration. This is the Senate. This is the part of the building in the centre of Cardiff. Um, two major areas that impact upon the university sector is that education is devolved and health. Because a lot of the universities are involved in allied health, medicine, and dentistry, um, that's important for us uh, in the university sector. And we then have the opportunities in Wales to do things slightly differently. Um, and quite often, we do do that. And I must admit that sometimes, and I've voiced this with some of my colleagues, I think sometimes we do things differently just to be different, <laughs> even though it doesn't necessarily Makes sense. Uh, and that, I would argue, is a reaction uh, that you could get in several countries or in other countries. So you can get that happening. Now, first quiz, or first and only quiz today. Right, here's some individuals. I think a couple of you may have seen this before in the US last November. Um, these are all Welsh people. Can you identify all six? Top left, that's not the easy one. Top left, who's top left? Okay. Middle, top middle. Yeah, these are too easy for you. <laughs> top right? Okay. Bottom left. Who? No. How do we get bottom left? Is there a prize? No. <laughs> <laughs> we have a glass of wine. Is it Pamba Gaston? No. You've had too much wine already. Do you have a picture of what? 
There is a balance. There is a balance. This is the that is important to you because of the internet. <laughs> okay, it's Donald Watt Davis, the inventor of packet switching. So I the internet. Watch. The next one in the middle? Cristiano Ronaldo. <laughs> So this guy gets to spend more than <laughs> Gareth Bale. And then the bottom right, you get the bottom right. Livingston? The other half of Livingston? Stanley. Stanley. The famous doctor that did that. All Welsh. Um, I had to do this, I did this last November, in, last November in Park City. I had to do this because nobody had a clue who Wales, where Wales was or who Welsh people are. Apart from Captain Zee Jones, I'll show you last. Um, right, itchy sector of Wales. Um, relatively small, um, about 10 universities, or there were 10 universities, including the U, and it's now shrunk. Um, it's shrunk down to seven. And I'll tell you a little bit about more of that, uh, some of the, the issues we've had with that as we go along. So you can see, that's what we've got. We've got 131,000 students. Now we have two interesting characters appearing on the same events. Gentleman on the left is Leighton Andrews. Leighton Andrews is the Welsh Government Minister for Education and Skills, or was until June 13. Um, quite an aggressive politician. He had some very good ideas and some very good policies, but unfortunately he didn't seem to gel particularly well with the universities. <coughs> there was a lot of tension between them. And the tension got worse in many ways because of a number of things. One was there was an issue with the University of Wales that blew up the press, you may remember that. Um, and that sort of tarnished the whole of the Welsh sector. But also then, one of his policies he brought in was about regionalization and reducing the number of universities that there were in Wales. There were 10 at the time, and he wanted to bring it down to six. So he was forcing them through mergers. And things were getting very, very difficult. Um, and the press loved this. They were looking for any story on this. They were picking this up. Um, so, what I was thinking was, you've heard that expression, never waste a good crisis. <laughs> we had a crisis in the HE Wales. The tension between the government, the HE sector, and the media. Now, we were through a couple of things, but before we got to that, Leighton Andrews suddenly disappeared in June 2013. And it was like, all politicians, they ultimately end their political careers in failure. And the failure in this particular case was that, as part of the Welsh Cabinet, he approved the policy about regionalisation and restructuring of hospitals. Uh, and they agreed to close a number of hospitals, including one that was in his own constituency. And as a member of Cabinet, he signed up to this. However, the next week, he was spotted on a protest line outside the hospital, protesting against the closure of the hospital <laughs> in his own constituency. So he had to follow the sword. And there was a big sigh of relief with the AHE sector. The new education minister has got a very different approach. He's much more interested in schools and the school sector. The PISA scores in Wales aren't particularly good. His focus now is trying to address that, so looking at schools, and not such a focus on the achievement. Right, go back to OER, and what we do with OER. Um, well, as I said, never waste a good crisis. Um, one of the things that we discussed at the structure of Higher Education Wales is that we have HEW, Higher Education Wales. It's one of the constituent bodies of the UK. Um, but it's got its own committee of vice chancellors, and it's got its own subcommittee. 
Um, there's two subcommittees. There's a PVC research group and there's a PVC learning and teaching group. Uh, I chair the PVC learning and teaching group. And one of the things we discussed was, is there anything that we could do to try to counter a lot of the bad press and the bad issues and the bad feeling? Was there something that we could do um, to change that? And we were lucky. We were lucky because at the time, all of the hype exploded about MOOCs. And it was MOOC this, and MOOC that, and MOOC the other. It was, it was everywhere. Yeah. And we thought, okay, can we take advantage of that, but can we do it in a different way? Hence, at one of the meetings, we discussed the idea of open educational resources and how we could use that to do some of the things that we wanted to do. And to build bridges with the government and the funding council. Now, now, one of the things that you never want to do is go to a meeting for the vice chancellors. <laughs> the shoot committee has all the vice chancellors from the else on it. And if you go along to those, you'll find that they just argue about everything. Um, they're all protected in institutions, and it's very rare you get them all to agree. To the point where, when I went to the Hugh Committee with this proposal, there was one of the vice chancellors, and this is where the indiscretion comes in, uh, who, when we talked about this, said, we could be world class in research, but we can't be world class in teaching. And I was absolutely staggered to hear a vice chancellor say that. In fact, it's the other way around. Um, in most instances, there's not much easier to be world class in teaching. It's much easier to be world class in teaching than it is to be world class in, in research. And I was absolutely staggered with that. Now, thankfully, the other vice chancellors didn't all buy into that. But there was healthy skepticism among them. Um, so what we did was, at the next level, at the PVC level, we worked <coughs> together. Because the PVCs actually talked to each other uh, and collaborated. And we worked together to come up with this proposal um, about the we are and to do something collectively as a nation rather than trying to do things individually. Now there's a huge amount of good practice, and I know some of my Welsh colleagues from Aberystwyth are here today talking about some of the practice that they've been. There's good practice, lots of around. What we needed to do was to get past that uh, and get this at the national level on the agenda. That we're going to make changes. You've got to do that. You've got to do a bunch of vice chancellors, and 9% of you start talking about bringing in any technical phrases at all, but they are going just go straight up their head and they'll switch off. But if you don't start talking to them about branding, about internationalization, about how you may be able to actually get an income stream out of some of this, all of a sudden there's a different view coming from the vice chancellors and they take interest. Some more than others. However, by working through the PVCs, we were able to manipulate the vice chancellors. Now, the other thing that was happening as well was that FQ, through the government, were talking about digital learning. And by the government through FQ, we were talking about digital learning. And that previous education minister, like Andrews, um, is technologically savvy in inverted commas. He uses Twitter. And he's got into quite um, aggressive debates with some vice chancellors on Twitter. Um, he thought, great, what else we've got to do online learning, but he just focused on MOOCs. It was just MOOCs and MOOCs. And what I persuaded the vice chancellors to do was to say that, look, if you let him run this, real things done to us rather than us doing what we want to do. I said, we've got to go on the offensive. We've got to produce a plan and a strategy that shows that the institutions can work nationally to drive forward this agenda. So rather than having it done onto us, we would do it ourselves and influence Welsh Government. So I spent a lot of time talking to Welsh Government, talking to Hefke officials for the Funding Council, and talking to the Vice Chancellors. And eventually, we got that buy-in from them. Now, one of the scary things with the Vice Chancellors was that they thought the minute we talked about ADR, 
we were going to expect them to release absolutely everything open to the world. That everything would just go out there. And I said, no, that's, that's, the, that's not what we're trying to do at all. What we're saying is, we want you to start working towards releasing material. We don't expect everybody to release everything. We just want you to start moving in that direction to start that ball building that momentum. And with that, they felt safer with that. So we were able to get them to move in that direction. To the point where we had the Wales Open Education Declaration of Intent. What we did was we took the Paris Declaration and we, we adapted the slide, we put it in a Creative Commons license, and we got the VCs to sign on. This is a picture of Colin Reard, who used to VC at Cardiff. Um, and he signed that um, last September. Um, it's a declaration of intent. All we're saying is we're putting down a marker that in Wales we want to move to be much more open than what we do. And we've sold it to the government and saying this is a, an area where Wales can be distinctive. We can do something differently and we can have a much bigger impact than the size of our nation allows. Now I know uh, my institutions involved in the OERU um, is coming up with Macintosh out of New Zealand. And I know New Zealand are very progressive in this. And they've been working and developing all this openness across with, uh, New Zealand. Um, but I know it's got sort of bogged down in some of the politics. And I think Wales sort of sneaked in before. Um, but we've sneaked in a little bit. But we made a statement. We set our stall out and we say, this is where we want to go. So what we're starting to do is, by saying that, we're influencing government policy. And then that government policy is coming through, to a group, into statements like this. And I mentioned that Open and Online Higher Education Digital Working Group um, this was the one that we didn't actually want the government to do, but the education minister insisted in doing it. Um, they came along and they talked to us, and a lot of what we said basically was translated straight into this document. So this document is now with the education minister, with the government, and we're expecting a, a response uh, from them. We managed to get Hefku to give us a small amount of funding. It's only 150,000 pounds. Um, but it's a start. And what we said we would do is we said that we would establish an expert group made up of all the institutions across Wales and that we would do certain things. Because they were looking for outcomes from this. And we had to deliver or start delivering certain things. So the first thing we said we would do is we were trying to deliver a showcase portal for the OER. Basically showcasing what Wales has already done and highlighting good practice. It's very much a promotional front. And it really just directs people to individual institutions. Some institutions are much more active than others, depending on it. But it's a branding position in being where we develop for Wales as a nation. So that's part of the project plan. We're also developing a SMOOC. Um, I hate the word MOOCs. We're talking about MOOC. We're actually going to develop a SMOOC, which is a short, massive, open online course. And what we're doing that's slightly different is this one is aimed at individuals about to go to university. So it's about students about to go, and it's about surviving your first four or five weeks of university. There's nothing academic about it. It's about surviving your first five to six weeks. So it's managing loneliness, managing your learning. Uh, managing your social profile, the things that you put on Facebook are going to be there to haunt you forever, all those sorts of things. Uh, what do you do when you get lonely? Who can you go to? Um, how do classes actually work? Do tutors ever return assignments? You know, all of those sorts of things. What's different about it as well is that it's going to be facilitated by students. We're going to have students actually working with other students to run this. And Again, it's completely open. Anybody can take it, do what they want with it. 
Um, and it's there really just to showcase what we can do with well to support students both locally and internationally. Um, um, because the government policy around higher education is about economy and social justice and widening participation, not just in Wales, but internationally as well. The bit on the right is, for me, the most important bit. Um, it's open educational practice. As a senior manager at a university, I quite often wonder why do I have academics that are continually rewriting material that's already out there. So for me at the minute, it's the practice of open educational resources. How you can take that material and bring it together. So how can you bring a bit of an iTunes U course, a bit of uh, open learn, something that's on YouTube, how can you bring all of that together and create a good learning experience rather than constantly focusing on how do you build resources. Well, the resources element is important, but for me, it's the open educational practice. Which is why my institution, and what's coming through from HEF Pure in their guidance is that they're expecting us to build that into our teaching and learning strategies. So as we go forward, they're looking for that open educational practice. So we said, we would start to run workshops on open educational practice and start that ball rolling. I'm not mad. I know we can't do all this with 150k and do this in the next year or so. But the whole idea is to get something up, get it running, show a little bit of improvement, and then we can go back to the government and say, look, this is working. Give us some more to do the next stage and to keep developing that gap. And then the final bit is about exploiting those champions. And we've heard some of the champions today. It's hard to exploit those. How do you get past the enthusiast stage? How do you get it to the senior level? How do you get the, the vice chancellors and the pro vice chancellors to buy into this? Because if you don't, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. So our strategy has been twofold. One is at an institutional level, by living these workshops and OEPs at the bottom up. But then secondly, by influencing government, saying to government, we want you to tell us that we should be developing who we are and who we It's essentially going to do it anyway, but we want them. And we may even get some more funding out of government to do it. Uh, Debbie is our project manager. Debbie's here. Where's Debbie? Down the back in the corner. Yeah. Did you see that girl? Yes. <laughs> yeah. She tells me what to do, where to go. Um, I need hands with the slides. Um, so, what next? The timeline of where we're hoping to go. Um, there's been a little bit of slippage on it, but not a huge amount. And what we're hoping is that by OER 2015, you all come to Cardiff. <coughs> We'll have done a bit more on this journey. I have a bit more meat on the bones. So, finally, we'd love to invite you to Wales. We've organised for OER 2015 at the Royal West College of Music and Drama, which is part of the University of South Wales. It's, been, it's the National Conservatoire. It has a fabulous venue, a superb concert hall, and it's right smack in the middle of Cardiff. And we will host a dinner in the um, National Museum of Wales. So finally, Wales are really small in size. <laughs> 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 questions or comments apply. I certainly have a question that um, 
it's been running me for quite some time. It's actually surprising because at OER 13, we had a big conversation, didn't we, about copyright and about the challenge of trying to work. So we're talking much more now. The language has changed to open practice rather than just a conversation around copyright and difficulties. But I think this remains an incredible challenge for individual members of academic staff. I don't know, I think there are people in the audience who know more about and have more hands on experience about this than I do. But what's your comment about how we get the average academic who has an incredibly busy day um, and a busy week and a busy, they're doing research, they have administrative responsibilities, they're teaching, and then on top of all of this, we ask them to become experts in copyright so that they are able to fulfill that notion of practice. I mean, do you have a comment on that, Guy? Because I think we're a long way from having um, a, a cohort of staff who have those skills sort of endemically available to them. We are, yeah, and I think that's, that's a key issue, is getting past that. I think what we've got to do is, it's, it's moving from this position of individual academics doing all the teaching and moving into a based approach to teaching. Where you've got the learning technologists, where you've got copyright experts uh, to support an academic to do that. And it means then, within institutions at, at a structural level, restructuring how you provide support to academics. That's, that's one part of it. But the second part of it then is, and I recognize that a lot of this is, people would see this as, oh, it's just a lot of thing on top of what I do. We've got to find mechanisms to reward staff through either pay or progression promotion for doing these sorts of activities. And I think once you start to do that, you start to build that momentum around that. People see the value of doing that um, rather than just thinking, I have to do research to get promoted. Um, if you've got individual academics who can get promoted based on this sort of work, they become exemplars and champions for other people to go forward. But it's not, it's not an easy, it's not an easy solution. Thank you, Clive. Um, we have a question from Jackie. Jackie, introduce yourself, please. Hi, Clive. I'm Jackie Cutty, University of Manchester. I'm Hamda. Uh, I'm sitting here, <laughs> running our show. Sure. Um, my question is about size. Okay, so as you were speaking, I was thinking about the NDLR, the NDLR in Ireland, the National Digital Learning Resource. Yeah, I've probably got that wrong, but um, they've sort of gone through previously what Wales has gone through in this stage is now. But you mentioned just how the issue about size and cohesiveness and um, influencing numbers of people who can make a difference. What are your thoughts about how what you've learned in Wales could be applied in India? Right. It's a completely different dynamic. Um, the culture's different as well. Um, I said we've got much more access to government than you would have in England. Um, I think if I was trying to do this in England, I wouldn't necessarily do it the same way. I think part of the thing that helped me was that there was a lucky grouping of things coming together, events that I was able to take advantage of. I think in England, I'm not sure I'd even try and force it at a national level. I would be looking more at a regional level or sub-regional level with universities partnering together because they would have the size and the population mass to do those sort of things. But I think eventually what will happen is that every university is going to have to do this and it's going to have to be embedded within each individual university. So my own personal view is forget the future learners and the course areas and all of that. Future <laughs> Fighting talk. Yeah, it'll be the individual university, so it'll be it'll come down to that level. Um, you may well still get one or two that'll survive, that will become the brand, um, but they don't own everything. There's lots of universities and colleges all around the world, I think it will become really important for us as individual institutions to do that. Um, we'll have to. But England, mm, pay me enough we'll have Moving to Scotland. Yes. Hi, my name is Lauren Campbell, I work with CITUS. And to some extent, my question falls on from Jackie's. Um, good to hear you join us on the border soon. So, what do you think uh, you can bring from your experiences in Wales um, to Scotland in terms of open education? Thick skin. <laughs> <laughs> Very thick skin. And a big coat as well. Um, Scotland from the outside, I think there is 
there's a lot of good science going on, but it's all on individuals. Now, our individual institutions. I think in the government, I think one of the things I'd be looking to do is to influence government. Um, I think I would want to influence government through the University of Scotland. I think it leads to a much stronger push from the University of Scotland to the government to provide this sort of activity. Um, and you've already seen it in some of the stuff we talked about this area today, about what Edinburgh's been doing, the good work that they've been doing. Um, but I haven't seen a huge amount of that from elsewhere. Right? And I think my approach would be through the University of Scotland is to put pressure on the Scottish government. And um, I could bring the experience that we've had in terms of the impact that we're now having. Um, and by working together, this is what we can do. Um, but until I actually get there, I don't know.